Um, one of the things that I've noticed that developers are struggling with a little bit now is, is how to self-publish. Um, the role of the publishers has changed fairly radically with the introduction of free-to-play games as a primary monetization model. Um, and this is something that Torsten is here to talk about. How do exactly. you take your organization and make it into a self-publishing organization? Thank so you, David. Looking Thank forward you. to hearing you. Hearing well, thanks, you guys, for, for having me here. I always like Singapore. Um, I've been here a lot. It's, it's a great place to be. A um, little bit about myself. I am uh, luckily enough to have enjoyed playing games and making money for the last 24 years. I started very early on in, at the end of the 80s as a journalist at uh, one of Germany's first games magazines. And funnily enough, when I started, um, not only as a gamer, but also in a professional job, it was pretty easy for hobbyists to get into the business because you could code yourself on a Commodore 64 or Amiga or any other machine and you could just create a game. Um, the challenge came later, but at least you could do that. And then it changed to consoles where nobody could get a development system unless you're a multi-billion company such as EA and you couldn't really start something yourself and get it out there. So there, I've been through, through some interesting um, changes. Um, after that, I used to work for Sega for quite some time. Um, launched the Mega Drive, uh, Sonic, or Genesis, it's called in the US, Sonic and some other games. Um, worked for the toy company Hasbro, I set up at the mid-90s their games division in Europe, Germany and France. So we launched CD-ROM games like Monopoly or Battleship and, and others. And then I worked in the US in 98 to 2000, I was the CEO of a magazine publishing company in San Francisco. Eleven years ago, I started Indigo Pearl as a consulting business for PR and marketing for, for technology games and toy companies. Um, we now have 50 people. Not only do we do games and toys, we also do big brands, so we bring gamification to brands like Unilever, social media to Unilever. I also have a second business called Indigo Pearl Games Financing, where we help um, developers to finance games. Um, I just listened to the Grandma speech. I'm also a dad of uh, twins. They're at home. Um, I'm video Skyping with them, so I can just underline um, their two lives. Uh, actually, their three lives. One uh, business second father, and third gamer. Um, I also try to set a part-time just for playing games, which is pretty key in my life still. Um, in the old days, when I started about 20 years ago, publishers were really there to get your product out there. When you managed to develop a game, you needed manufacturing. You needed distribution. You needed to get on the shelf. I mean, basically, a publisher was the gatekeeper to retail. Talking US terms, if you couldn't get your product into Walmart, you were dead. That's why you need a publisher for it. Publishers also did marketing, uh, PR, and all the kind of stuff. So they were really necessary. But they were really also a pain in the butt, especially for smaller developers. Um, in today's world, it has changed, especially small and mid-sized developers and indies have big chances of getting the product out there. And that's what I want to speak about um, today. But let me give you a little preamble. Bad games will never succeed. If you're EA, if you're Ubisoft, if you're an indie developer, if you do a crappy game that, that's no fun, nobody's going to buy it, nobody's going to play it, even if it's for free. So the first and most important message, I guess, of anybody in this industry is try to really make a good game. Try it harder with or without a publisher, without a lot of money, or even with a lot of money, if there's no fun in the game, nobody's going to play it full stop. The good news is, since we have the internet, we c could cut out the middleman, i.e. the retailer. To me, retailers were greedy, were very aggressive, took no risk, and were of no help if you needed help in a difficult situation. Um, when, when I worked at Sega, we had to give the retailer 50% margin. So I don't want to hear anybody complain that you have to give Apple 30% margin. Um, we had to give the retailer a lot of money up front called co-op advertising to have a little stamp size ad in a, in a media prospectus in a newspaper. Upfront money. We had to pay them for shelf space. A lot of money to get a nice shelf in the store. But more painfully, we had to give them 100% right of return. So let's say we shipped in 100,000 Sonics. A couple of weeks later, we could have received back 50,000. Of course, 
we paid the core, core of advertising, the shelf space, and so on. So today is really heaven, because you cut out the middleman. There's no freaking retailer anymore who has right of return and wants so much money up front. So again, I'd urge you to appreciate you only have to give 30% to Apple or to other platform holders versus what you had to do in the old days. I actually feel old standing here saying that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but the bad news is it's not actually heaven also. It's, it's still hell. Imagine, I mean, you know, if you're looking, if you're comparing today's world with the old world, imagine the retail space being all the shops out there today, all the online shops and platforms. It's like a game spot retail shop with billions of shelves where you can walk for miles and see product after product after product after product. You have no orientation. Discovery is the big challenge today. Discovery in a store with, what did I just hear, 800,000 apps? Um, just imagine a retail store with 800,000 products in store. Uh, that must be a pretty big retailer. So discovery is the challenge. Before we go into that, um, I guess what you also need is cash cash to develop a game. In my personal opinion, for uh, game developers, and I'm talking also indie game developers, small game developers, venture capital could be the devil. Um, venture capital is not always your ally. It sounds so easy, right? Talking to a bunch of guys, get five million money in, have a good life, developing creative titles, pray and hope that they will sell. In reality, maybe, I don't know, 0 0.5 or 1 out of 10 venture capital uh, funded companies work. Most of them don't. And obviously you always read about the great examples such as Supercell uh, and, and, you know, and Rovio maybe, but you don't hear about all the others where entrepreneurs who started the company went through painful processes. VC stolen their shares because there were some down rounds financing because targets wasn't matched. And I tell you, this is not what you want in the creative industry. I know you need money if you start something new. I understand it's like, you know, cloud nine when you look at Supercell and others, but it's a really painful process working with VCs, especially at the beginning of a game developer, because from a VC point of view, you are like a table of roulette. The math of being successful are pretty low. It's not Texas Hold'em. Really, it's roulette. And that's why I believe if you need money to develop a product, look into project financing. Try to find somebody, super angels, standard business angels, friends and family first, to try and fund your project. Promise them a return based on your revenue, not shares of your overall company. And if you manage to start it that way, you can keep control of your company and you only risk and give away revenue share of your intellectual property revenue that you generate directly or via partners. At a later stage, venture capital obviously makes sense. I'm not saying that the devil for everybody. I'm just saying be aware it's not heaven. It's not cloud nine if you work with venture capitalists. I had some investments in some online gaming companies also, and I saw it when they didn't you know, hit their targets. They did down rounds. And at the end, like the entrepreneurs who started it all had like 2 3%. What's the motivation? What's the motivation to come up with creative games? So really, I just urge you, be careful and try other ways of finance if possible. But also, let me remind you, um, regardless of venture capital, again, quality of your product is key. If your product sucks, then your revenue will suck. Pretty simple, regardless of your marketing, regardless of your PR. Guys like Vlad, who happen to be a journalist, will not write nicely about your product if it sucks. Dean Takahashi, we saw it uh, on the presentation beforehand from VentureBeat, MobileBeat, will not write nicely if your product sucks. So try to have a really, really high quality product. And quality is often misused as production value. It's not about production value, it's about a fun gameplay. So keep this in mind when you develop products. Another thing people often forget IPs. If you invent a product, it's your intellectual property. Protect it. Develop it. 
take care of it. Keep your IP. I always compare it with a baby. It's your baby. Would you ever give away your baby? Would you ever sell your baby? No, you would like to keep it. You'd like to grow it, to groom it. And that's what I would urge you with your IP. It's yours. Act responsibly. Keep it, protect it, don't give it away. Also, don't screw with it. You know, if you have a, a great title, it's successful. Oftentimes, I saw people just rushing out the second version of it. When it's crap, you kill your brand, you kill your IP. Be very careful with it. Talk. There has been this fashionable thing, such as NDAs and embargoes recently. So I see developers approaching us, my PR division in, in, in Germany, and saying, hey, we need PR in Europe. But actually, can you do it with an embargo? So people shouldn't really write about it. And can they sign this 255-page NDA beforehand? And please don't talk about it in social media channels, because actually we don't want anybody to see something about it yet. To be honest with you, this is the total bullshit. What you want is you get your product message out there as early as possible, because it will help you with discovery later on. It will increase your SEO possibility, your, your online advertising possibilities. It will, it will increase your brand awareness. Protect your IP. I mentioned that before. Make sure your IP is protected. And from a gameplay idea, do you really think nobody in the world ever had a similar idea that you had? I promise you, somewhere in the App Store, somewhere in the last you know, 30 years of gaming, somebody had a similar idea. Nobody's going to steal your fantastic, never-been-done idea. It's more important that you get your message out there. Trust your PR people. Involve them very early on. Make sure you get your message out there. Don't even start with embargoes. Media hate embargoes. You know, if you want to upset media, approach them with a new development studio, a new game, and talk about embargoes. There you go. Your coverage is going to be zero. PR is your friend. Treat them as your friends, not as your enemy. Social media is your ally. The other thing which is important, and I compare it with the first date. I see it so many times. I've seen it in the last 25 years, I don't know, thousands of times. There's a new product coming out. You manage to get appointments with the key media people. Then the developer comes and tells me, oh, Torsten, I only got three screenshots. You know, that sucks. If you go out on a first date, what you do, you groom yourself. You, you put on your best clothes, your best dress. You really look nice. You want to show your best assets in order to take the girl home or the guy home or the partner home. In gaming, many times I see people not grooming the product at all. So make sure you create the best asset pack in the world. You create the best screenshots in the world. You create nice information about the products, why it's unique. Um, you know, just make it easy for the media to write about your product, but also to visualize your product. The more and the better assets, the more and the better the media coverage is going to be. And the same stands for social media. It's the same message, but differently packed. Create special assets also for social media. Don't just rely on a couple of screenshots that you've taken, I don't know, after having a beer or something like that. Social media channels are oftentimes considered as, ooh, dangerous, because actually consumers talk to me, and I have to answer them. Oh my God, they can express their own opinions even, even worse, right? So you're scared and you fear that they would write something bad about your product on the social media channel. Um, guess what? Social media is not your enemy, it's your ally. You can use it. Try to turn your fans into ambassadors. We just saw the number of fans that uh, Gameloft had, quite amazing actually. If they manage to turn those into ambassadors, that's the best free marketing they could get ever. Engage them early on. Be responsive. And of course, I don't need to remind you, but let me still do it. It's a two-way channel, so don't wait eight weeks if somebody approaches you with a question. Try to answer it immediately. It's like email, two-way, not one-way. Measure, not your waste. We saw it at Gameloft. I don't think that were enough KPIs, by the way, that he was showing. There are a lot more you can measure. 
you develop a product, try to establish your KPIs very early on. Use tools such as AppMetrics or Flurry. Um, develop your own if you can. And not only measure mouse and dose and, and ARPUs, also if you're a free-to-play, measure activities on items. What item is bought? How is it used? Measure gamer behavior. I mean, it's heaven. When we worked at Sega, I think my marketing budget in 1993, just for the German market, by the way, was 70 million Deutschmark, approximately 35 million euros. We spent a lot of money on TV, but we never really knew if the Sonic that got bought at Toys R Us was because of the TV ad, because of the mom just went there by mistake and bought it, um, or because of the PR article. For you guys, it's heaven in today's world. You know exactly where your consumer is coming from. You can target it very, very precise. We only had a shotgun. You guys, you, ha you can do marketing with sniper rifles. You can do revenue share deals. It's heaven. We just had to invest the money up front. You can acquire user by user. How great is that? We just could place an ad on the TV or in the print magazine. And then user behavior. We never knew how people played the games. We didn't know how many hours they played. Of course, we could, what we did, we paid a lot of money for market research companies that gave us some numbers. But did we really know, you know if they were true or not? No. But now, with the right tools, you can measure everything. You can not only do that, you can also use that measurement as a communications channel. Think about CRM. There are tools out there. I just mentioned AppMetrics, um, where you can exactly see, okay, how many people bought which item? When did they buy it? Okay, I want to just email the guys who never bought the golden sword. Cluck, immediate communication channel to do some advertising towards the target group. That's, to me, coming from the older world, so to speak, it's a dream. It's a dream come to direct communications based on user behavior. So if you develop a game, think about those kind of channels in addition and include the measurement stuff very early on. I mean, how many guys of you aren't free to play? No free to play? Do you uh, do CRM based on gaming behavior? Do you directly send messages to people who buy certain items or didn't buy certain items, for example? Let me ask a question. Why don't you do that? It's, it's from a marketeer point of view, right? It's heaven. You can address exactly the user that hasn't done something or has done something. You can do so many more things in today's world, especially in free-to-play. The, the problem that I see from a marketing perspective is, and many, and many developers, the, the whole CRM measurement thing is like an afterthought. I would urge you to think about that when you create the game design and then implement it very early on. I told you so many things that you can do so far, but how do you do it if you're a small developer? I'm a big fan of outsourcing. In the development world, developers, especially here in Asia, you are, you're aware of outsourcing. You source out to China um, graphic stuff. You source out you know, to, to other countries animation. Um, why don't you source out the things that you're not good at? PR, marketing, measurement, social media. I would urge you to outsource whatever prevents you to create a better game. If you don't have the people that are specialists in the segments I just mentioned, it's better to focus on what you can do best to create a quality game, a high quality game. But it's really important, it's really, really important to think about the stuff I mentioned and to really use companies that can do that much better than you do. And the advantages in today's world, you don't need to only prepay them. There are service providers out there that you can pay based on your revenue stream that's coming back. There are service providers out there that, get, yeah, that you can use for free, like AppMetrics, um, until you have reached a certain MAU or DAO number. But there are also PR and marketing agencies out there that work based on revenue share. So when you create a game, don't forget those things too if you want to turn yourself from a pure developer into a publisher. And those things have worked in the past. I mean, I saw many developers um, doing that. Um, there's a big possibility. Give you an example. There's one guy 
who created Tiny Wings. How many, have, how many of you have heard of Tiny Wings on, on the iPhone? Um, there's one guy sitting in a boring city 100 miles north of my hometown, Hamburg, on the northern coast of Germany, where it's always bad weather. Um, he created everything by himself, more or less. Number one title in the App Store for many months. He made millions. Managed to turn himself from a developer into a publisher using outsourced tools um, and so on. Even Rovio, who started with Angry Birds, and used an external publisher, uh, Chilingo, with the original launch of Angry Birds, turned themselves, of course, in a larger scale, uh, but turned themselves into a publisher now and, and helping out third parties. Um, so there are a lot of possibilities to become your own publisher in today's world. And using the, the distribution possibilities we heard from Gameloft and others, um, and the stuff that I mentioned before. But there's also you know, another important thing I would like to, to urge you to take into consideration if you're looking into becoming your own publisher. And this is really, the work really starts when you launch your product. And oftentimes, developers that I know stop. Product is launched, let's go party! And they will never look into the product again. Please, 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 please. I mean, this is the time where your work really starts. And nobody said this is going to be a piece of cake, but uh, this is where you, know, where you have to do your after-sales marketing, where you have to do your CRM uh, based on your tools, do the KPI, optimize and optimize and optimize your product. There's a reason why there's no tiny wings, one, two, three, four out there. There's just tiny wings, and they're optimizing it you know, with any release and making it better and monetize it better. So today, you really don't need a publisher to do manufacturing. You don't need a, a publisher to go into the app stores. You don't need a publisher to get distribution. Um, you really don't need a publisher to do the marketing. Um, all you need is great talent to create a great game and great partners that you can rely on for the things you need that you don't, you know, are able, that you're not handle, unable to handle within your company by yourself. There are service providers out there that can do that for you. A final word to me, a game is not a technical product. To me, a game is a setup of teams with different capabilities that ultimately create entertainment value that keeps me smiling, laughing, crying, uh, keeps me entertained for hours. It's not purely a technical product. And I urge everybody to understand that and to look into the games market from that perspective. Um, well, with that, I can only say thank you. I hope it was interesting, and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you, Torsten. I think we have time for a question. Any questions from the audience for Torsten? Um, hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the talk. Uh, I really enjoy it a lot. Um, so yeah, so since you mentioned that uh, uh, today are, we are living in the heaven right now because we, we, we can go through uh, bypassing uh, so many things and get a game out there. But um, I want to know on your opinion on the, um, the side effect of that is that we have so many game developers coming up, indies coming up, so um, there are tons and tons of games coming out every week. So the market is kind of like oversaturated. So what do you think about that? Is it a good thing for us? Or um, because we have like a lot of competitors right now. and. Uh, even gamers, on the gamers' opinion side, um, they are facing so many new games every week. You know, it's very hard to keep like uh, get interested in one game and keep playing on because there are more options always coming up. So um, yeah, I want to know your opinion on that. Thank you. Well, uh, what can you do as a developer? You can't change the output of others, but what you can do, in my opinion, is change the way of your communication strategy. And if you manage to be able to communicate your message very early on, which not a lot of people do, they try to start communication when it's done, not beforehand, you can learn from the traditional gaming companies who start the communication about 18 months prior to release. So, you know, leaking screenshots, getting the media involved, starting the social media channels, trailers, and all the traditional communication stuff that will help you in the uh, distribution process, but also in the process of, you know, finding your product in the App Store. Um, personally, that's not, not purely business. I'm actually a big fan of so many developers doing so many great games because what happened, in my opinion, is creativity came back into the games industry. 
you know, a few years ago, it was really boring. There was Tomb Raider 1, Tomb Raider 2, Tomb Raider 3, Madden 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, and so on. Now you can see fantastic indie games. You can see really creative games that are fun, that are not just based on pure production value, but they really bring the entertainment value back, at least to me as a user, and make me smile, make me laugh, you know, you know give me an, a great time, and not just the fourth iteration of a Tomb Raider, which I have been playing, I don't know, 20 years ago. So that's two different angles, but you know, again, get in the communication early is what I would recommend. Thank you for your time and your presentation, Torsten. Thanks, everybody.